All right, well, this morning we're going to look at a very familiar text that is um, often used in, in this question regarding um, how the Lord views our children um, in, in His church, in His, in His covenant. And um, hopefully, again, we'll, we'll see what that means and what it doesn't mean, because I do, I do think some have taken it way too far and have said that all of our children are elect, all of our children are going to be saved, or, or they even look at them as presumptively saved and treat them as though they are saved. Uh, I don't think that that's what we see. As a matter of fact, I don't think we should presume that at all. And we're going to see many examples uh, of those who are in that same arrangement who didn't have that outcome. Um, so I don't think we should assume that. But, but there are certain things that we, we should expect and we, we should assume. Uh, and I think things that will help us with regard to our parenting. Uh, and again, regardless of where we are um, in that process, I, I think it's something that really goes on to the very end of our lives. <laughs> We're parents. Um, uh, our, our children will always need us in some way, even if they don't think they do. Okay. All right, well, let's read the text, and then we'll, we'll go from here. Okay, now this, this comes at the end of the sermon that was preached on the day of Pentecost, you know, the mighty rushing wind, the sound of speaking in tongues, and the gathering of the group of Jews that were there for Pentecost, and they, they heard them speaking of the wonderful works of God in their own dialects, and that was a miracle that God used. It was also a witness to Israel that um, uh, the Lord was, was there. He was doing something. And Peter preaches a very powerful sermon and indicts the people of Israel that God had sent them the Messiah and yet they had crucified him. And um, when he brought that message home and the Spirit of God brought it home with power, um, this is the result. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? Okay, we're in, we're in danger. I mean, we've, we've done some pretty serious things against God. He's going to be angry. What, what can we do about this? And Peter said to them, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, sounds ideal, doesn't it? I mean, it sounds like um, a paradise in a certain sense because of, of all the wonderful things God was doing, the camaraderie, the fellowship, the, uh, the hunger, it seemed, for the Word of God, the, the sharing of possessions with each other. And we, we do need to remember, though, that this was a, uh, a special... These were special circumstances. All these people converted on the day of Pentecost needed to be discipled before they could return home. And they hadn't really planned on staying that long for the feast. I mean, the feast only lasts for so long, and probably not more than a week. And then they need to return home. Uh, but they couldn't under these circumstances because there were a lot of things they needed to learn. And so the needs were great, and I think that's why there was all this sharing going on. Not to say that we shouldn't share, we shouldn't help those in need, but I don't know that we should promote a Christian commun communism, so to speak. Okay? All right, but there's, there are, again, certain things you want to see in this text regarding uh, what we might expect to see in somebody who is a believer, okay? as far as those that were received into the church. But... <clears throat> We also want to ask that question, 
about the children because there is a very important uh, principle that is given in what Peter says to them. So again, let me just um, start off by just giving you a glimpse of what we're looking at tonight. Tonight, Dr. Godfrey will tell us that when the Puritans came to the new world, uh, they came with their old world view. Okay? They, they didn't want to start something entirely new, but rather to have a place where they could perfect what the Lord had already begun, where they could establish a church that was faithful to God's Word in its doctrine, in its worship, in its church government. And they believed that if they could do this, that it would have the effect of hastening Christ's coming. Now, Dr. Godfrey is going to tell us that they, they were Calvinists and they understood that God has, has His plan. And they have His time frames. They really can't hurry him up, but they also believe that faithfulness would certainly pave the way for the success of the church and Christ's kingdom in the world, which included missions as well, because they knew these things needed to take place before the Lord could return. Now, if you've heard me talk about end times, uh, one thing I keep emphasizing is the fact that the world needs to be reached with the gospel before Christ can come. And a large portion of the world has not been reached, so I'm not expecting to see Christ coming today or tomorrow or even a year from now. You know, it's, it's something that he's, I don't think he's going to return until, again, the, the, the kingdom of God, the, the message of the gospel has been shared throughout the world. And, and I believe that, that these Puritans believe the same thing, which means that they want to get busy doing the Lord's work and extending the kingdom of heaven and extending really uh, the, the faithfulness or the worship of God throughout the world. Well, things were, were going well for a while, but within a few decades, a problem developed, and that is that their children didn't quite share their enthusiasm uh, for this vision. And so the question arose as to how they might be able to ensure Notice that the succeeding generations, this is something that Dr. Godfrey is going to say, that the succeeding generations would be true believers. How do you ensure that the succeeding generations are going to be true believers, that their children would be faithful, as faithful as they were, perhaps even more so, which they can't be unless they are true believers. And it also intensified another question they were already asking, and that is what should be required of church membership. Now this morning I want us to think about the answers to these questions from our passage because obviously they are still relevant for today. Now the first question we want to ask is this, how can we ensure <laughs> that our children will be true believers, that they will be faithful to God's covenant? Well, let's, let's try to get a running start at this, okay? First of all, I want us to note that our passage tells us that children are a part of God's plan. Okay? They are a part of His plan. They are a part of His people, part of His church in a certain sense. Okay? Now, Peter encouraged those Jews who were convicted by what they had done and who asked what they could do. This is what he said to them. Repent. And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Now, let's unpack what it is that uh, Peter said to them. What, what does this mean? Okay, first of all, he says they needed to repent. They needed to turn from their sins, okay? And we need to remember that, okay, as over against what Dr. Godfrey talked about conversion, okay? He said there's a difference between conversion and you know, believing or trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not sure how, how you really can separate those two things because faith and repentance always go together. If, if you're turning away from something, if you're turning from sin, you're turning to the Lord Jesus Christ. When Peter says repent, he doesn't just mean put off your sins and then be baptized and everything's okay. Uh, the message is 
turn away from your rejection of Christ and what you've done to Him and receive Him as your Messiah, okay? Uh, these two things are inseparably joined together. Uh, you, you can't have one without the other. Um, this is the work the Spirit of God does to bring us to Christ, and so these things will always be joined together. So first they needed to repent and believe. They needed to trust in Christ. Then they needed to receive the sign of baptism, okay? That is the mark of God's ownership in the new covenant. And he said, if you repent, if you believe, and if you receive this sign of God's covenant, notice you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, sometimes this can be kind of confusing because we know as Calvinists that you have to receive the Spirit of God before you can even believe, you know, before you can repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Peter here is not referring to the gift of the new birth here. He's not saying repent be baptized, and then you'll be born again. Uh, again, because they, they couldn't repent and believe without that. But he's referring to the power that the Spirit of God gives according to the promise that he had just quoted from the prophet Joel. Let's not forget this is a, a sermon that, that has a point, and he does start earlier talking about, you know, what you're seeing here is what Joel spoke about, how in the last days I'm going to pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. That promise of the Spirit, that empowering of the Spirit was the promise that he's referring to. If you repent and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you receive baptism, you will receive this gift of the Spirit. And just remember how many times we see in the book of Acts that after they receive Christ and they're baptized in his name that the Spirit is poured out on them. Again, it was a sign that God was showing that they were being included in his church, but it's separate from the new birth that brings them to faith in Christ. So this is the promise that's being, that's being referred to here. But I want you to notice that this promise, the promise of the Spirit to those who believe, wasn't just for the adult Jews, was it? The promise is for you and for your children. And, of course, we'll get to those far off in just a moment. So just as God's promises, all the promises He had made to His covenant people had been passed down to them, to the adults, because they were the children of, of those that God was in covenant with many generations before, all the way back to Abraham, okay, even as it had been passed down to them, the promises for you, so also it was for their children, the promises for you and for your children, and, he says, because the Lord was intending to include the Gentiles, those who were far off, that's referring to the Gentiles, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself, okay, it's also for them. Now, first, let's, let's take a note of this right here. Unless the Lord calls, okay, no one is going to believe. No one is going to receive what was promised, either from the Jews or from the Gentiles. But now here's a distinction, okay, that you need to get this distinction. Even though they may not have what was promised, they can still have the promise. I hope you can see the difference between those two things, okay? Let me ask you this question. Did, did the promise that God had made to Abraham, did it apply to all of his children, okay? The promise of the Messiah, the promise that he would be a blessing. So they can have the promise, but did all of them receive what was promised? No, because they didn't all receive the Messiah, right? So you can have the promise but not have what was promised, okay? I, I want us to make sure we understand that distinction. The promise was made to them that if they repent and believe, they will receive the Spirit. That, that promise was made to their children as well as to the adults because they were a part of God's covenant people. And presumably the same would be true, of course, for the Gentiles who are called into God's Covenant people, because remember the, the olive tree in Romans chapter 11, that what the Gentiles are being brought into is God's covenant dealings with the Jews. And where the Jews don't believe, they're the branches broken off, and the Gentiles who believe are the branches that are grafted in. Presumably, that same promise then of the Spirit of God and of the Messiah and the blessings that are in Him would also apply to them. 
Okay, if, if they believe, it also applies to their children, that is, the, to the Gentiles' children. Now, again, is there anything different between that and, and when we go out and evangelize and we offer Christ? Well, if they believe, they're going to receive the same blessing. Well, that's those who are far off that the Lord is calling to himself. But the point I want to, to just focus on here is the fact that it's also applying to their offspring, okay, that the promise when, when the adult receives it also in some way applies to them. It's a promise given also to them, something the Lord wants the adults, believers, to pass on to their children. Now, this, that the Lord shows this kind of mercy, okay, to children, to the children of believers is really nothing new because this is how God has always dealt with his people. Let me give you a few examples. When he saved Adam and Eve, and I do believe he saved Adam and Eve, okay? Even though they're responsible for our situation, the Lord did redeem them to himself, okay? Did the Lord have nothing to do with their children? No, he, he actually brought, began to deal with their children as well because very early on we see the children of Adam and Eve worshiping God. God was dealing with Adam and Eve's family. When he warned Noah about the flood that was coming and told him to build an ark, did, did, was Noah the only one who got on the ark besides the animals to be saved by that ark? No, God actually warned him and told him to build the ark for the salvation of his household, okay? And when the Lord made his covenant with Abraham, did he make it just with Abraham? No, he made it with his whole household, and interestingly enough, not just his physical offspring, but also everyone that belonged to his household, including the servants, okay? So everyone that was a part of his household was brought in to the covenant and received the sign of the covenant. Now, let me just point out that this principle is, is called covenant solidarity, okay? That sometimes the Lord views us as one unit, even though we may be many. Um, this is a principle that holds true for blessing, as we've just seen. I'm going to bless Abraham and his offspring. I'm going to bless Noah and his offspring. Adam and Eve also had, they had blessing because of, of uh, God's mercy towards their children. It held also true for cursing as well as blessing. When Achan stole the items that were under the ban, from Jericho, remember that he wasn't the only one who suffered for it. But he and his wife and his children and his servants and everything that belonged to him, they were all stoned and they were removed from, from Israel. And the same thing held true in other cultures of the time. This is just the way that people viewed things in those days. Remember how Daniel was accused and thrown into the lion's den? And then when the Lord spared him and he was lifted out the next day, the king was angry at those who'd accused him. He didn't just punish them, but he took their whole households and threw them into the lion's den and they were all consumed because the king didn't look at the accusers as just being individuals, but he imputed their crimes to their whole family. We see the Lord doing exactly the same thing. Now, God does see us as individuals. I'm not saying he doesn't do that. Each of us is going to have to stand before him to give an account of our lives. But he does also see us as family units, okay? Uh, sometimes God would look at Israel and refer to Israel as one person, you know, uh, because of the covenant solidarity, even though they were a mixture of some faithful, usually very few, and the vast majority of them were not. Remember how the Lord says that even though the number of the children of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, it's only the remnant that's going to be saved. But yet God looks at this whole crowd of people. In, in one instance, he's, he's saying through Balaam how lovely they are, how they're the apple of his eye. And then the very next thing that happens is God's plague is breaking out among them because they're committing uh, immorality with Midianite women, Okay. So we have to understand this idea of covenant solidarity, this idea of viewing a group as one person. God views families in that way. And that helps us to understand what God means in the second commandment. 
after he says we mustn't make or worship him through graven images, we read in Exodus 20, verses 5 and 6, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, and that he means by that thousands of generations. And, you know, I don't think we even have a thousand generations from Abraham yet. To those who love me and keep my commandments. And what this means is simply this, that God removes his mercies from the children of those who hate him. In other words, what the parents do affect the children for good or for bad, but he, he maintains steadfast love and mercy towards the children of those who love him. So God promised, remember, to be God to Abraham and to his children. He promised that he would show them his loving kindness, his covenant mercies, his faithfulness to a thousand generations. I think that's what Peter is referring to in this passage when he says, the promise is for you and your children. Every promise God made to the Jews was for them and for their children, and that, that shouldn't surprise us at all. But here's the real question. Okay, granted, God shows covenant mercy to a thousand generations, to those who are his people. Does this covenant mercy, does this loving kindness that he shows to all these generations, does it guarantee the salvation of those generations? Is this a promise that if we are faithful to God, that he will save our children? Well, there's a lot of people who believe that. Okay? There's a lot of people within our denomination who believe that. There are denominations perhaps that are even more uniformly believe that this is the case. But if that's what he meant, that's what God meant, then we have to ask this question. Doesn't that mean that, that the children of the faithful we see in the old covenant and even before the old Mosaic Covenant, shouldn't it be true that all their children were saved? Right? If, if God deals with one individual and he shows his loving kindness to their children, if that loving kindness means these children are going to be saved, then shouldn't we expect all of the children of these faithful, you know, believers to be saved? Well, let's, let's apply that in the Old Testament and see if that's the way it works out. Okay? What about Noah? You know, what about his, his family? You know, what, what about Ham? Ham was cursed by Noah because of the way he dishonored him. What about Abraham's children? I mean, he's the one who received the promise, didn't he? Shouldn't all the Jews have been saved? I mean, all of Abraham's children would be saved, and then all of their children would be saved, and all of their children would be saved. And, but what about Ishmael? What about the children of Keturah, Abraham's third wife? How many Jews were destroyed in God's judgments over the years? How many of them rejected Jesus Christ and handed him over to death? And even when there was that great revival that took place on the day of Pentecost, we have to recognize that the vast majority of the Jews were still not saved. And what about Isaac, the, the, the child of promise? Were, were all of his children saved? Well, remember, Isaac had Jacob, but he also had Esau. And it wasn't a Jacob's sons that wanted to kill Joseph and instead sold him as a slave into Egypt? That doesn't sound too godly to me. Isn't it true that Samuel, who was such a godly man, a prophet of God, that his sons did not walk in his ways? They weren't converted. But here's the, here's the real, the real um, example. Adam and Eve. Okay, Adam and Eve were, were saved. God redeemed them. God slew animals. He covered their nakedness. He, he offered a blood sacrifice for them. Uh, he put enmity between, you know, Eve and, and the serpent, which and there's only two camps you can be in, either the serpent's camp or in God's camp. At least we know that Eve was converted. She was brought back to him, and I believe Adam was as well. But what about their children? Were they all saved? Well, I don't think um, Cain was. Do you? But who are the children of Adam and Eve? The entire human race, if all the children of believers were saved, then the entire human race should be walking with the Lord, but they're not. So God's promise of his steadfast love for our faithfulness 
to a thousand generations does not guarantee the salvation of our children. I wish it, I wish it were a guarantee, but, but it isn't. I think we know that by experience. But what does it guarantee? Okay? It does guarantee that God is going to show them his kindness, covenant mercy, steadfast love, which I think we have to categorize as common grace, okay? kindness and mercy. And why does he do that? Well, he does it because he's faithful. He does it because he does have an interest in those children. He is their God, and they are his people, but it's also meant to lead them to repentance. But here, here's the point. This repentance is completely dependent, and we'll all agree on this, dependent on his choice. They have to be his chosen ones, okay? And there, there's nothing that I see in Scripture that indicates that all the children of believers are going to be elect. As a matter of fact, the evidence that I've just given you shows that that really isn't the case. So now we have to ask this question. If we can't guarantee their salvation, if God doesn't guarantee it, does that mean there's nothing we can do? There's nothing we should do? Is it completely in God's hands alone? Well, no, in, in a certain sense, it isn't. Because remember that even if God chooses, there's still means to the end of salvation, isn't there? Um, God doesn't save in a vacuum. God, when he elects someone, will bring a witness and he'll bring a testimony and he will bring the gospel to them. And then he will convert them in, in his appointed time. Okay, we cannot forget what we read earlier in Ephesians 6, 1, you know, where Paul, first of all, reminds us again, the children are included in the covenant. He calls them to obey their parents. He says the stipulations of the covenant, the blessing stipulation, uh, or actually it's a sanction, uh, also applies to them. If they honor their father and mother, it will be well with them, and they will live long on the earth. God will show them his covenant mercy. And by the way, that it goes well with them, they live long on the earth, does not necessarily mean they're saved. It just simply means God's showing them mercy. But it also reminds us that parents have an obligation towards these children. In verse 4, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That, that's a summary of a parental responsibility to our children. Don't make them resentful. Don't mistreat them. Don't require them to do things beyond their abilities, except, of course, teach them to obey the Lord. That's beyond their ability, but that's the one area we have to have an exception. Don't show favoritism. Don't treat them unjustly. Don't discipline them too harshly. I mean, there's a myriad of ways we can provoke our children to anger. We need to be an example of Christ's love and mercy and patience towards our children. We are to set an example for them. But rather than provoking them to anger, he says, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Train them in righteousness. Teach them the right way to live, the right way to behave, the same as the old covenant saints were to, to teach their children to obey the law of God, the Ten Commandments, which is a summary of what it means to love. Remember, it's, it's love. It's not... When, when it is, it is a series of don'ts, you know, and God does put it in a negative way because we need to hear it in that way, but it's also a series of do's. Don't do hateful things, that's what he's saying. Things that injure other people, things that offend him. But do those things that are loving and that help others and that, that honor him. That's what we are to teach our children. And we also, of course, need to correct them when they go the wrong way. One thing we have to remember is that we can't change the heart, but we can correct their behavior. And the Lord does tell us that we do need to correct their behavior when they go the wrong direction. When we see them hating, we need to, you know, discipline them to get them to stop doing that and begin doing the right thing, at least outwardly, you know, so that they're not injuring other people. And we need to remember, too, the discipline is something that always has correction in view. There's a difference between discipline and punishment. This is not retribution. You did something wrong and now you're gonna get it. You know, that, that's not what we do. But you did something wrong, that's hurtful for you and for the other person. And you need to learn to do the right thing. So this is training in righteousness. This is 
modifying their behavior and getting them to go the right direction. And oftentimes that entails using the rod. But sometimes the rod doesn't work. We had a child that didn't work with one of our children. It just made them dig in more. But we found something that did work, that modified their behavior. We take away what it is they're after, and they can't have it until they modify their behavior. Or if they can't, something they shouldn't have, they don't get it at all. But we, you do what is necessary to get them to change their behavior without abusing, of course. Without abusing them. You modify their behavior. And let's not forget, too, that when you do discipline them, you do need to deal with their heart. Those are the times when you can really speak to the heart. And you, you try to help them understand their need of Christ and their need to do things the right way. And show them how good that is and how right that is. You know, some parents, their children get out of line. They're just like, or one of our members, I won't mention who it was, used to say, I didn't have time to do all of that. If my children got out of line, I just smacked them, you know. Well, no, that's not what we're supposed to do, smack them, you know. We're supposed to love them. We're supposed to train them. We're supposed to help them see the right way to go. And the, 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 again, the, the beauty of that way, but again, only the Lord can show them the true beauty of that way. But here's another way of putting it, the way Jonathan Edwards put it, that we are to seek for their salvation. This is the way we seek for their salvation. We have to assume our children really are not converted unless we see them loving Christ, reading His Word when they're able to do it, spending time in prayer and wanting to go to church. If we don't see that, we need to assume they don't really know Him. So we need to seek salvation for them. You know, they're not going to be seeking God's mercies if they don't have the Spirit of God in their heart. Uh, we need to seek it for them through our prayers, through our evangelizing, through our encouraging them to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ through our discipline, okay? All of these things are meant to point them to Christ. Now, if they leave our homes without having come to know the Lord, I still think we're the only ones that are going to be seeking their salvation. So we need to continue to pray for them. And as we have opportunity, share the gospel with them, point them again to Christ. Now, again, we need to ask the question, does that guarantee that they're going to be saved? No, it doesn't. But they won't be saved apart from these things, okay? Okay. We are putting them in the way of salvation. Why, why do we go and share the gospel with anyone? It's because they're not seeking the Lord, and we need to seek the Lord for them. You know, we need to bring the gospel to them. We need to pray for them. Well, we need to do the same thing for our children. We need to put them in the way of salvation. We need to use the means that the Lord uses to save when He does save. That is the only thing we can do is seek salvation for someone else, for our children or anyone else. The rest is up to God, okay? But we have to do these things because they can't be saved apart from these things. The Lord is not going to save apart from these things. They need to hear the voice of Christ. You know what Christ's comfort was when he was evangelizing? My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Remember when he told that huge crowd that he had fed the 5,000 that were looking for another meal, and he says, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, and they said, we can't, we can't hear that, and they left. Jesus said, didn't I say, to, you know, to his disciples, or he said to the people who were leaving, didn't I tell you that no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him? He didn't say, oh, I need another argument. I need to be able to be more persuasive, um, you know, get them more concerned, um, he just realized that if they were his sheep, they would hear him and they would follow him. And, and that's true with regard to our children. If we teach them the truth and point the way to Christ, if, if they are Christ's sheep, they will hear his voice and they will follow him. And how will we know that they're saved? Again, when they begin to follow Christ, when they love him and follow him from the heart. Let me just add one other note. As long as they're unconverted, they're going to find our seeking their salvation to be very annoying, right? They're not going to like it. They're not going to like it until the Lord changes their hearts, and then they will thank us for it. 
But again, the Lord has to change their heart. Now, that's really just answering the first question. I haven't answered the second question yet. I'll have to do that, I think, relatively briefly. I will try. The Puritans, remember, as we've seen, they wanted a pure church, but they also wanted godly government in their respective colonies. And in those days, only church members could vote. So they began, they were asking the question, and this, as Godfrey is going to tell us, this, how do we ensure the future generation is going to be faithful? This intensified the question, what should we require for church membership? It, it does in this way. We want a pure church. And if only those who are members of the church can vote, we want to make sure that those who are members of the church are actually converted people so that when they vote, they're going to vote for the right kind of leadership so we can have a godly state, believe it or not. Do you, do you know that um, Godfrey is going to point out as well that there were church state, sorry, state churches in those days? There was never a national church, but there were a couple of colonies that had state churches. And if, if the only people who could vote in that colony had to be members of the church, well, then think about what you would require of the person coming for church membership. You want to make sure they're, they're genuine believers, right? Well, okay, that isn't the case today. You know, people can vote if you're a citizen of the United States, if you're a citizen of the state, but we still want a pure church, don't we? So the question is still important. How do we determine who becomes a member of the church? Well, we know there are some churches that consider you a member if you come regularly. If you come, you're a member. Uh, one of the churches that Don and I were a part of years ago, Calvary Chapel, said you're a member if you're a part of one of our Bible studies. You know, it didn't matter whether you came to the main meeting, but if you were a member of one of the home fellowship groups, we can see you're a member. Others give you a form, and they say, fill this out, and you'll become a member. But what does the Lord require? That, that's the question we want to answer. Well, we do need to understand, first of all, that there is such a thing as church membership. Luke tells us in verse 47, the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. That is, they were being added to the Jerusalem church. You might say the, the first church, you know, that, that existed. Paul's later going to tell the Corinthians that they should remove a man from the assembly of the church because of the sin of incest and hand him over to Satan for the destruction of his body that his soul might be saved, okay? Now, the question is, how can you remove somebody from something if they aren't already first a part of something? There was something to be removed from, and that was from the membership of the church. When Jesus was teaching his disciples regarding church discipline, remember what he said? If somebody sins, go to them. If they don't repent, go with one or two more. If they don't repent, then take it before the church. And if they don't listen to the church, they should be treated as a Gentile and a tax collector that they should no longer consider that person a part of the fellowship, okay? That's what we call excommunication. They can't come to the Lord's table. They can still attend worship, but they're no longer considered a part of God's faithful people. So Jesus contemplates the idea of removing people from a number of people that are considered to be his and can come. And again, that has to do, of course, with the... Uh, keys of the kingdom, as we saw earlier. Now, secondly, we need to understand that not everybody admitted to church membership is necessarily saved, right? It, it's a mixed group. Um, we were just reminded what Paul told the Corinthians, put this man out of the membership that he might be saved. Now, it did say earlier that God was adding to their number as many as should be saved, but that, that's not necessarily genuine salvation. It just simply means that the person was confessing to know Christ, and so they were viewed as being saved. You do get unsaved people into the membership of the church. So again, Paul says, remove him so that he might be saved, you know, that Satan might deal with him. We saw last week how John speaks of those who were part of the church, who eventually left because they were never really a part of the church. Yeah, false, false sons in her pale, as we 
as we sang earlier. Peter speaks of the, the sow, you know, the pig that gets washed, who professes faith in Christ and is baptized. It doesn't mean he actually does get washed because his nature was never changed. And he goes back to wallowing in the mire again. That means he leaves the church and goes back into the world. It happens. And then let's not forget what Jesus has to say in his kingdom parables. Remember, he says in the parable of the sower that there were those four types of soil, and three of them looked very good. Only one of them actually produced fruit, but there were two that gave the indication of spiritual life, the stony ground hearers and the thorny ground hearers, but they eventually showed themselves not to be true. They turned out to be false. Well, undoubtedly, some of those get into the church before they're revealed as being false. His parable of the field reminds us that even though the field is full of wheat, the enemy is sowing tares in that field. And it's, it shows us that the church is really a mixed character. It, it's a mixture of both those converted and unconverted. And really, that's because the elders who are responsible to admit to membership are certainly not infallible, and we can't see the heart of any individual. I mean, we might have somebody coming to us and they say, I love Jesus, and I believe the gospel is true. But then they become a member of the church, and by their actions, they, they show they don't believe either of those things, right? Because if they did, they would continue to do what it is they promised to do when they joined the church. That It's inevitable that that's going to happen because, again, the elders cannot see the heart. But thirdly, that doesn't mean that the church is to admit known unbelievers, okay? I mean, just because the church is a mixed character doesn't mean that the elders are to let everybody in. There's supposed to be some kind of an examination. Now, those who were admitted in our passage, they received what Peter said. They were convicted of their sins. They repented and they trusted in Christ. They submitted to baptism. Outwardly, they appeared to be true believers. And by the way, that baptism was their admission into the visible church. And so we asked the question, what should we require today? Well, first of all, we need to require that those who become members know and understand the gospel, right? No one can be saved apart from the gospel. The Jews in our passage needed to hear it explained by Peter before they responded and were convicted and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, we need to require that they repent and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So they need to understand the gospel and they need to actually trust in Jesus alone. Okay? When they heard the gospel, they were pierced to the heart. The Spirit of God brought the message home with power. They turned from their sins of having crucified him, and they received him as their Lord and their Savior. Now, here's, here's something that may not be quite as obvious. What we ask for from people who are, you know, coming for church membership is we, we ask them, do they, they, first of all, do they understand the gospel? And then, do they believe the gospel? They believe those things to be true. Do they believe they're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ? And then we ask for their testimony. And that is, how has the Lord changed your life? And that not, may not be immediately obvious here in our passage. I mean, what, what is the evidence here? What is the testimony here? Well, think about this for a minute. What is it that they were before Peter preached? And what was it that they were after Peter preached? And did Peter see some kind of a change take place in their lives? And did they profess to have turned from their sins and to believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, Peter saw that. The apostles saw that. They saw that transformation on that day, but the elders don't get to see that unless you happen to be converted right on the spot when we're explaining the gospel to you. Uh, but even so, you know, we ask for that testimony. That's so we can know that you're going the right direction and we can know that your, you know, confession, your profession of faith is not a false profession. I mean, there are some people who believe they're Christians, but they're committing and living in sin, and they shouldn't be. Uh, and maybe they don't understand that, or maybe they do, and they don't care, and that's something we need to, to know before we admit them. Okay, so we ask for their understanding of the gospel. We ask them to 
tell us whether they believe that or not. We ask for their, uh, their testimony. And that's something every Christian loves to share. And for everyone, it's not going to be the same. It's going to be a little bit different. And sometimes it's hard to know exactly when that conversion took place. But the fact that we do love the Lord now and we are following Him now, that's the most important part, isn't it? Because we all come from a background where even if we thought we knew the Lord, unless we were converted from infancy, there was a time when the Lord changed our hearts. And it may not be as obvious for some as for others, but it happened to all of us if we are true believers now because we came into the world dead in sin and the Lord made us alive. And then finally, if those coming for membership haven't been baptized, then we baptize them, which is again what happened on the day that um, of Pentecost when those who profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they were baptized and there were added that day 3,000 souls to the church. Okay, and let me just n note this as well, that what, when Godfrey talks about uh, church membership tonight, he's talking about in, in a world, a, a church view, a, where children are already a part of the church in some sense. And so when you ask the question, what should be we required for church membership? Well, they already believe the children were members, so what are you talking about here? Well, they're talking about communicant membership, where the child you know, professes faith in Christ and then is allowed to come to the Lord's table. That is something that goes on in, in uh, Pado baptist churches, okay? They're considered to be a part of God's covenant dealings because the promise belongs to them, because God deals with them, because He will be a God to us and to our children. But they're not saved and we don't, you know, believe them to be saved until they actually profess faith in Jesus Christ and begin to live as Christians. So, the same thing would apply to them. They would have to profess faith in Christ. They would have to own God's covenant. They would have to be able to testify to the work of His grace in their hearts before they become communicant members. Well, so all this is simply to say that the Lord is the one who adds to His church. He's the one who does it, okay? The elders simply look for the signs that he actually, actually has done this. And remember, the elders do not admit to the invisible church. You know, when, when God, uh, or I should say, well, when Christ gave the keys of the kingdom to, his, to, his, uh, to Peter and the apostles, he wasn't saying, you can now open or close the kingdom, the invisible kingdom, to anyone. That's what the Roman church believes. They believe they can, that they can shut the doors of the invisible kingdom uh, to you, can throw you out of the invisible kingdom, they can condemn you to hell. Uh, the elders don't have that kind of authority, only God can do that. They can only look and on the basis of what they see, either admit you to the visible kingdom, the church, the local church, or exclude you by way of excommunication if you're in unrepentant sin. But they can't admit or exclude from the invisible kingdom, that would be the same as granting salvation and then kicking you out of, of salvation. They, they don't have that authority. But finally, let's be encouraged by these things, okay? Just to be faithful. Faithful to do what the Lord has called us to do, which is to be, you know, to, to own Christ, to trust in Him, to, to obey Him, to follow His law of love, to, to be his witnesses in this world to our children and, and to others outside the, uh, the church. And, and remembering that, yes, you know, apologetics can be helpful, but no matter how convincing we are, we cannot convince somebody into the kingdom of heaven. Ultimately, the Lord is the one who has to do that. We just simply need to be faithful to tell them the truth. Make sure you get the gospel in that presentation because his sheep will hear his voice and they will follow him. That's, that's the act of God actually changing the heart and bringing them into the invisible kingdom of heaven. And then presumably they will seek to become a member of the visible kingdom by becoming a member of one of his churches, one of his local churches. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, and let's, um, as we think about these things, let's ask the Lord 
to prepare us as we come to the table this morning, uh, thinking about what a true believer is and, again, our obligations um, to be his witnesses. Let's think about where we may have failed, confess our sins, renew our trust in Christ, and come to the table to receive his grace and his help to do what he has called us to do.